Good morning, everyone, or should I say good day? Sorry, I said I wouldn't do that, but I did it anyway. Welcome to the Barnes Children's Literature Festival at home, or indeed wherever you are. I am in my library at the moment. Um, we are having people perform all over the world this morning, which is amazing to see. Thank you, everyone that has joined in. Thank you for all your messages. Your questions are flooding in. I have one small request. Make your questions the funniest and the silliest, silliest questions, questions, and we will be doing those at the end. And now I'm very excited because joining us this morning, live from the other side of the world in Melbourne, is an award-winning, best-selling author of titles that include the Treehouse series of books and other very silly, inappropriate titles such as The Day My Bum Went Psycho and Once Upon a Time, please give a very big virtual round of applause to Andy Griffiths. All you, Andy. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Um, oh, no, it's, uh, yeah, good morning to you and it's good evening here. It's just, just gone dark. Um, Thrilled to have so many people visiting uh, us at our treehouse today. You can see I'm in the, the writing room at the moment. And just over my shoulder, you'll notice uh, Terry Denton is, uh, is there. He hasn't got any clothes on, unfortunately, and he's, he hasn't been eating much lately. I think I've been working him a little too hard. Uh, he is very busy when he's not just standing there um writing drawing all the pictures for the 130 story treehouse at the moment which will come out in october uh so we're uh, looking forward to that and i'll tell you a little bit about that today you can ask me questions uh, about anything you want to know about the series and um, i will try to answer them truthfully and if i can't answer them truthfully i'll make them up uh, sounds like a good deal. Great. Let's uh, start. I'll show you a couple of my favourite levels first. Um, there's there's a very special level in the treehouse, which is called, and I know many of you have visited there, uh, it's called the burp bank level. And it's where we put all of our burps and any gas that you might have um, when you come to visit us in the treehouse or even in this session today, you might, uh, you might feel the need to burp and I would like you to burp into the burp bank there. You can see everyone doing what they've been asked there. And what I thought we could do is just start with a communal burp at the moment because we're always collecting more burps. This is my mobile burp bank and uh, I thought it'd be nice on the count of three uh, I will, I'll count to three and then I want you all to burp any spare burps that you can spare. They'll come all the way through your computer uh, and into Australia and then I'll deposit them on the burp bank later, uh, the burp bank level after the presentation. All right, so I'm removing the lid here. Is everyone ready? Everyone got a big burp? Ready? Okay, on the count of three. One, two, Three, burp into the jar. There it is. Yeah. Oh, they're coming in. Whoa, it's a it's a gale force wind in Australia here. I think the weather bureau is gonna be alerted to this. Yep, I've got them and thank you very much. 
um, what a what a wonderful wonderful uh, harvest this has been today. I'll put those into the Burt Bank straight uh, after the presentation. Um, I've got a jar full of eyeballs here too. If anyone has a spare eyeball, um, you can't put those through the computer, obviously, but you could send it to me in the post, um, even though the post is a little bit slow between uh, the UK and Australia at the moment. Uh, just send me your eyeballs. I'm collecting them. Uh, there's something to do with the 130-storey treehouse there. Now, another favourite level is well, a couple of favourite levels. This is this is one of my favourites from the uh, the 104-storey treehouse. That's the tangled up level, and you'll see you should never go in there. Um, otherwise, you will get tangled up. And you've probably noticed that I am in there, but that's because I was rescuing Terry who went in there. And you're probably saying, why did Terry go in there? He went in to rescue this, um, this uh, little thing down here, this cat, the Silky. Silky got tangled. So Terry went in, uh, he got tangled, I went in, I got tangled. And of course, we got Jill to help us because Jill fixes everything. Another level that I like a lot is the refrigerator throwing range. I think uh, we all love to throw refrigerators and um, this is a place where you can do it safely uh, without hurting anybody, unless of course you, uh, you actually hit them with the fridge. Now you could be wondering why do we have a refrigerator throwing range? It's because when I was at primary school, we had this joke and I thought it was the funniest joke in the world and I'll share it with you now. Uh, it's a very Australian joke, so you may not find it funny. Uh, why did the boy fall off his bike? Anyone want to have a guess? Why did the boy fall off his bike? Um, I can't see any answers there, but I'll tell you because his mother threw a refrigerator at him. Of course, it was obvious in retrospect, wasn't it? Uh, we love that joke because obviously it's not really a joke. It's a joke about jokes. And uh, I used that to make up my first joke. Uh, now you're getting it. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the second joke I wrote, why did the boy fail his maths test? And the answer is because his mother threw another fridge at him. She waited until he uh, got, got better and then she carried the fridge all the way up to school and threw it through the window at him, creating the second joke. So it's actually quite easy to write jokes. Well, bad jokes anyway. Um, there is a third joke that I wrote. Let's see if you can get this one. Why did the boy suffer multiple injuries, crushed vertebrae, ruptured organs, brain damage and a very sore thumb? And the answer is, if you said because his mother threw a fridge at him, I'm afraid you're wrong. It's because he was hit by a truck. But don't feel bad because the truck was driven by his mother. Okay. Bad jokes is what me and Terry and Jill thrive on when we write these books. And um, that's where one of the sources of ideas come from, jokes and um, just messing around and playing with ideas and um, uh, pictures. Another place that ideas come from is the stuff that happens every day. And when I was writing a 104-storey treehouse, I was... Um, I was having a lot of tooth trouble. I was I seemed to be at the dentist quite a lot for a year or so there. And I started to think, I've done so much research here in the dentist, I could write a story about having a sore tooth because when you've got a sore tooth, it's very hard to do anything else. You certainly can't write a book or concentrate on anything. You've just got this this ache and it's it's not particularly funny. But I began to come up with ways to ease the pain and one of those was was writing about the, um, how how am I going to fix the pain so I can write the book. Now I thought rather than talk too much this morning, I'd give you all an interactive 
um, game where I'm going to get you to do something that I'd recommend that people don't do, which is to use the door of doom in the treehouse. Now, you might know in the 117-storey treehouse, we have the door of doom, which you should never open um, unless, you know, it's really serious. Now, I'm not, I, I'm going to give you a, ch a, a problem here, which is four doors of doom. And I want you to imagine you have a very bad toothache and that you need to get it fixed. And behind one of those doors, there's the, uh, there's the four doors of doom just there. Behind one of those doors is the dentist who can fix your tooth. Behind the other three are the dentists of doom. They are very bad dentists. They will make your tooth worse and they may even cause the end of your life. So this is a serious game we're about to play. And I'm going to take a group vote on to which door we should open to to fix your imaginary toothache all right so we've i've got stephen and richard standing by to uh to take the tally uh give me a number is it one is it two is it three or is it four richard and stephen which which way is the uh the group leaning today there are a lot of twos. Now some more threes, but it looks like a solid two. A lot of twos? A lot of twos. Someone gave us a five, Andy. Oh, 55. <laughs> oh, that must be Terry. Terry must be. Yeah, come, come in, because he never listens to instructions. Um, okay, let's go with two. I think two yeah. is the, uh, the official number. We are going into door two. Are you ready? You walk into door two, holding your 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 jaw. It's really hurting, and you see the dentist, and quite an unusual looking dentist. Very strong, obviously. She's um, she's lifting some teeth weights there, and she looks at you and she says, "Oh dear, that tooth has to come out. That is that is a bad tooth. Just hold still, and I'll pull it out with my wrench." And she starts pulling on the on the tooth, as you can see, uh, pretty basic dentistry skills, but she's got the strength and she starts pulling your tooth and she pulls and pulls and pulls and pulls until, unfortunately, your head comes right off. Whoops, she says, and... Um, <laughs> You don't say anything because your head just came off. Um, that was that worked. That worked out bad. And the next thing that happens is, of course, you die. Okay, so I'm so sorry that you made such a bad choice so early on in the presentation, but I'm prepared to give you another shot. We know now that it's not door two. All right, Here's, you get a free life. It's not door two. Let's see if you can pick the correct door uh, straight off. So it's uh, we're we're asking for either door one, door three, or door four. I'll just cross out door two there. Looking like uh, door three this time. We're getting a lot of threes. Another five. Terry's back. We got six six six. <laughs> Terry, get off. Three Get is definitely the, the winner. Computer. Go do your work. You're annoying me, as usual. Um, what do we get? Three? Three, yeah. Okay, three. Uh, three. Let's. Good luck, everyone. I hope, I hope you get it better this time. You walk into the dental surgery and you see, uh, oh, dear, another unusual-looking dentist. He is the, um, used to be a minor and uh he's got a toothpick in his hand he's got the uh the headlamp to really see what's going on and he says oh dear this is a bad tooth it's like it's going to need to come out and you go please not the pick that don't don't use that pick and don't use a wrench and he goes oh no it's far more serious than that i'm going to use tooth 
dynamite and he sticks an enormous stick of dynamite into your mouth and um, whoops just came out um, this is interactive origami presentation look at this um, he sticks it into your mouth and lights the fuse and runs out of the room and then guess what you explode it's quite a large explosion and oh dear your heads come off yet again and oh uh, something else explodes too hang on there's a secondary explosion just there um uh, it's actually two both of your bottoms just exploded and then guess what happens you're correct you die you're not very good at this game. I, I don't know if it's the it's too early in the morning, maybe. Oh, but I'm I'm okay. I'll give you another shot. Okay, you've got one life left now. You can have either door one or door four. Cross out three. This and Terry wild. crossed out five. There's no five. We can have one or four. What is it to be? It was 50-50 for a while, but I think it's a strong one. One is the one. Yes. Okay. Let's see how you go. And, oh dear, the worst possible person greets you at the door. It's Terry Dentist. And he says, hey, uh, I'm not a qualified dentist exactly, but I've got a really good way of getting your tooth out. And you go, it doesn't involve a tooth wrench or a toothpick or tooth dynamite. And you go, no, no, no. Uh, Terry goes, no, no, no. He says, I've got a real old fashioned method. All I do is tie a string around your tooth and then I tie one end to your tooth, the other end to the door. And then what I'm going to do is slam the door and the tooth will come flying out with the force of the, the cotton that's been attached to the door. And when I slam it, the tooth will come flying free. And so he slams it. But unfortunately, instead of the tooth flying free, you go flying towards the door and you're going flying so fast that you smash into the door and hit the door so hard that you die. Oh dear, this has been a bad morning for you all. There's only, there was one door, there's only one door left. Would anyone like to go through it? Anyone? What are they saying? Are they, have they had enough Stephen and Richard, or should we go through one I more mean, door? No, they're just they're shouting for now. They want to go through that door. I wouldn't, but they <laughs> want to. I'm scared. You still you still want to play this game? They're, they're you know really eager. I mean. <laughs> you know you're probably going to die. I'll, I'll give you a chance that to risk. stop now. No. no they're, they're, they're determined. Uh, there's a lot Andy, of fours on that screen, isn't there? 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 Uh, okay. You go, here we go, through the door. You pick door four. I've lost all my doors. Here we are. You pick door four. And as you walk through, very nervous, you see a wonderful dentist. This is what you've been looking for all along. It's actually Dentist Jill. And Jill is the best dentist in the world. And she, she doesn't even have to touch your tooth. She just looks at your tooth. And she touches it with her little magic wand and it's better. And she says, well, look, that went really well. I'm really happy with how that, um, that uh, tooth has come up. There's no need to take it out. It won't hurt you anymore. It's been a great morning. Unfortunately, however, she says, uh, there is just one problem. And you go, what's that? And she says, uh, you're about to be squashed by a fridge and for no apparent reason. And the fridge comes falling closer and closer and closer. And exactly as she says, you are squashed by a fridge. And you don't die, though. You don't die because suddenly another fridge falls on top of you. 
and you are squashed by two fridges and so is she and then you are squashed by an infinite amount of fridges which come falling out of the sky and then an idiot comes in stomping with a giant foot and stomps you and the fridges into the ground and then you 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 die but happy ending i think you'll agree because yeah you no longer have toothache there you go what's the moral of that story can anyone uh, can anyone think what the moral might be that's right never go to the dentist it's dangerous okay now i've been talking for a long time um is anyone left alive after that uh, rather ridiculous game i guess a game like that kind of encapsulates what i love about writing is that you can think anything you can do anything no one really gets hurt and that's the wonderful thing about imagination and books is that you can have wonderful adventures or terrifyingly stupid adventures so the the sort i love to go on um and and it's all you know fun you can close that book anytime you like so look i'm happy to uh to take a couple of questions now and see where that gets us and um we can do more stories as we go along but i've got richard uh well stephen's there i am um, here i have questions many questions many questions all right let's we'll start do with a couple one. now yeah okay one was henry has asked what is your favorite thing in the treehouse because his is the invisible swimming pool the invisible swimming pool um that is a cool a cool place um one of my favorites i guess i have lots of uh lots of lots of them uh this is the trunkinator of course the boxing elephant I've always loved loved this uh, little guy. He's uh, he's totally peaceful unless you get in and challenge him, and then he'll oh, he'll uh, he'll give you a boxing match. Um, I love making the the toys or finding the toys, and uh, Jill helps me to to make them into the the things. So the Trunkinator is one of my favourite levels. Um, of course, well, spy cows aren't a level, but that's a spy cow there um lots of so many characters that, that i really enjoy um we could have the trunkinator versus the spy cow who do you think would win in a fight between uh the trunkinator and the spy cow uh let's see if just oh. just type cow or trunkinator <laughs> trunky trunky That's everyone's better. everyone's pro trunky yeah well, one everyone's spy cow for trunky but no one believes in spy cow. Yeah, no, the spy cow can see him coming from miles away, and the spy cow is bigger and just jumps on top of him. So the cow jumps over wrong. the trunkinator. <laughs> they trunky can see. cow, trunky cow. <laughs> um, Amazing. And of course, there's actually one of my favourite things in the world are those wacky wave arming flailing tube men that you see outside of garages and uh shops when there's a big sale they yeah, always I'm amuse fine. me it's in, it's impossible to stay unhappy if you see one of these people waving at you and uh so they've always fascinated me and you'll find those in the 52 story tree house we uh we are confronted by a little waving arm forest of them and that's a present that uh, my daughter made for me last father's day wasn't that thoughtful my own wacky waving tune band not that he really waves Man. okay um ewan has asked can jill really speak to animals can jill really speak to animals well she thinks she can and uh and i know that because i know jill very well she uh is the editor of all of the books and in fact that's how we met um, she was the editor of my very first book 
which was called Just Tricking. And let me, I'll come back to whether she can talk to animals. Um, this is the Just Tricking, the Australian version. Where is, do uh, you have some English ones? Yes. No. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Just Tricking was the first book all about a character called Andy who plays practical jokes. And Terry uh, was with me right at the beginning there. And in those days, Terry just used to stay in the margins and he just used to draw up and down the, the pages. He made a whole drama out of the page numbers. He made flick pictures in the corners. You see the skull turning into a fish being eaten doors. And this was how we all started. And uh, Jill and I loved working together so much because she was able to take my very messy drafts and you know, cut them down, show me where the jokes were, write jokes of her own to put in. So we were working together very closely. Uh, we eventually fell in love and uh, we became married and uh, we've been working happily ever since. And um, Terry, of course, is, is a, such an important part of that, that group. And Jill told me a story once she said her, she grew up in a house full of animals and she said her sister was being really mean to her and she would pick up one of the animals, I think it was one of the guinea pigs, and pretend that she could talk and she was going, oh, really? And she'd say, Jill, um, that guinea pig says that you stink. And Jill would get very upset from this, of course, to have a guinea pig think that you stink. You must be really stinky. Um, and she, she, she would, she, she cried. And I said, when we're writing this book, I'm going to make you Jill in the in the book, and you're going to live in a house full of animals, and you'll be able to talk to the animals. And I'll make this this uh, this childhood sadness happy for you, in, at least in imaginary. Um, I did find out not long ago that she wasn't entirely innocent, though. And she would get revenge on her sister by when uh, Jill and her friends were in the room and her sister came in, they would pretend that they had X-ray vision and that they could see through Wendy's clothes. And then Wendy got very upset. So I don't know about Jill. I, I think she's not as nice as she seems. But Never are. She's pretty nice. Right, Armin has asked, in the 13th story, in the bowling alley, Terry uses your head as a bowling ball. How did mm -hmm. he get it off and did it hurt? <laughs> well, he, does, he waits till I'm asleep and then he does <laughs> this stuff. And um, my head is like many people, it's a screw-on head. Um, you might have had your parents tell you, oh, you're so forgetful if you didn't screw your head. Um, you know, you, you'd forget your head if it wasn't screwed on. And that was said to me a lot as a child. And one day I thought, I wonder if it really does screw on. Now you can check if you've got a screw on head simply by putting your hands over your ears and just giving it a gentle twist to the right. If that doesn't work, a gentle twist to the left. And if you've got a screw on head, it should start screwing off. And um, if, if it doesn't screw either way, then you haven't got a screw on head. Don't, don't just wrench it off. We've had enough of that for one morning. Um, it's been a very but yeah, that's what morning. he does. That's his idea of a practical joke. Um, this keeps popping up in the questions on the chat box. People want to know how many flavors of ice cream there are. That's how many flavors? There are 78 flavors of ice cream. A very now, the reason is number. 78 is a multiple of 13. And when we started writing the book, Terry had just by chance drawn a 13 story tree house. And I counted them. And even though I'm not very good at counting, I could count 13 levels. And I said, great, let's call it the 13 story tree house. And then when we did the next book, we said, let's add another 13 levels. And that's how we got to the 26 story tree house, which is the second book. Then we said, let's add another 13 levels and so on. So when we needed 
a lot of ice cream flavors. We said we had enough room to put 78, which is six times 13. And I know you're going to ask me which is my favorite flavor. Um, my favorite flavor is Rocky Road, although I am very partial to Winding Road and Dirt Road is fantastic. If you haven't Have you tried dirt every road, flavor? <laughs> I've tried every flavor, yeah. Even Good. even Flying Monkey, which I do not recommend. It doesn't sound too appealing. How do the mini horses combine into one? <laughs> That's really a question for Jill, but um, they're kind of just like Lego blocks. I imagine, you know, Lego blocks are little separate blocks and you click them into make a, a big whatever you want to make. Um, the little horses are the same. You're just going to clip them together and uh, you can have a regular sized horse. I just always like the idea of having little horses that would be big enough to have a little horse race in your hand. That um, has always appealed to me, that idea. So in it went to the treehouse. As it should do. Um, Rowan has asked, did you ever really work in a monkey house? <laughs> Well, funny you should ask. I, um, I came to the UK many years ago uh, in the 2000s and we were promoting one of the Just Books and there was a prize offered to a, a, re a lucky reader that they could come to the London Zoo um, and be a zookeeper for the day and I was part of the prize. Um, uh, not that I was in the zoo, but... I was, I was accompanying the prize winner, I think it might have been a few, uh, on, on the rounds of a zookeeper. And I found myself not in the monkey house, but in the giraffe house at the London Zoo. And we were mucking out the giraffe's um, living quarters. And it was dusty and there was giraffe poo and it was a horrible job. And I was like, I never wanted to be a zookeeper. <laughs> And I think that kind of stuck with me. So um, uh, we it turned into monkeys. But there was that little experience at the London Zoo. So I was also, um, I, if I had any doubts about whether I was supposed to be a zookeeper, I do remember that day going around with, with our group and with the zookeeper. And some little girls were there and we were in the penguin enclosure. And the little girls thought I was part of the zoo staff and she said what does what do penguins eat and i said as i i can never answer a question seriously um to a to a young child and i said well they eat fish but they especially like ice cream and if you can give them fish flavored ice cream that is the best and she went away <laughs> And the zookeeper stepped in and said, no, they do not. They do not eat ice cream. <laughs> do not get and I got, I got into trouble for telling someone a, a wrong fact about penguins. So I'm not cut to be a zookeeper, and that's why it's in the book. On the contrary, I think you are, but, it's, you know, opinions. <laughs> what, is, what is the strangest thing you've ever told someone, like, when they've asked a serious question? What's the strangest thing I've ever told someone? Like what's like the biggest um, white lie you've told someone as a joke? I feel like you do it a lot. Um, oh, I, I grew up in a, in a street. Uh, it was full of kids. Like there were lots of little kids and big kids. And one of our forms of entertainment, this was in the 1970s before, um, before the internet, uh, we just had to amuse ourselves by, by being out on the street. And, uh, and one of the ways we loved doing was telling kids ridiculous things. And I got really good at it with, by t with a very straight face. I would say to some little kids, oh, I um, had a bad experience in the bath today. I was, uh, I was having this bath and suddenly uh, a shark attacked me. And they go, did not. And I go, yes, it did. Look, look, see, I've got a, look, see that, that scar there? That's from a shark bite. That I couldn't have made that up, could I? And they go, you didn't. And I said, yeah, I did. There was the fin came through the um, through the suds, and I and I had all I had was a rubber duck to protect me. And I started whacking the the shark with the rubber duck. And if you say something straight enough, they start to go, oh, 
did it work? And you go, well, it did, but then a, a tentacle came out of the tap and grabbed me around the neck and, you know, I couldn't breathe anymore and it was, it was a terrible bath. Um, and so I love to get people in that, is this true or is it not true? And that's what I'm doing in the books. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you the most ridiculous, preposterous stuff, but in a very... But I'm believing it as I'm telling you, and, and that gets gets you into this lovely place where um, you kind of know it's not true, but it's also true. So that's one of the things I love about fiction. It's highly, highly possible that all these things did happen to you. Um, <laughs> there's been a lot of love for a lot of the characters or people, we should call them now because they are real people. Um, people want to know if Mr Big Nose really is your publisher. Um, you want to know if my publisher has a big nose and a bad temper. No. We didn't say that. He does not. He's a lovely person. He does not have a big nose and a bad temper. There Send we have help. A disclaimer. This is on video. This is on video. Oh. This is being recorded. Oh, no, you are live. My publisher is lovely. Um, in fact, she's a woman and her name is Claire and she has a very small nose. It's so small, it's like a full stop. It's like you can't even see it. <laughs> um, the, the role of Mr Big Nose is to be, you know, the story of the three little pigs and the big bad wolf. That wouldn't be as much fun if there wasn't a big bad wolf huffing and puffing and threatening to blow their house down. And that's Mr Big Nose's role, to be the big bad wolf huffing and puffing and threatening to send them to the monkey house if they don't do their work, which is the constant drama that we have in, in the books. And, of course, in real life, we all have things that we know we should be doing, but we're getting distracted and playing and messing around. And when you're writing a book, when Terry and Jill and I get together, there is a lot of messing around, but those that playing, that when you're off task actually is a very creative space to be in so it starts to form the backbone of the book so um so yeah that's 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 the uh we we don't have someone yelling at us to do the book but we know we need to get the book done implicit um there's been a lot of love for terry um people are a concerned that he's not moving um and b are pulling you up on some of the things you've said about terry in the books so people would like to know, well, these are not my words. These are, these are people's words. People have asked that in one of the books, you said Terry was an idiot. <laughs> Has this been scientifically proved? And that is from Iris. I think I have said in every single book he is an idiot. And, um, and as, as long as he's not watching now, I'll say he is an idiot. Um, but he's, he's a great drawer, a, an amazing drawer. He can draw anything. And he has such a random mind that's just firing off in all directions. And I, I do love him. And I love what he brings to the books. And he sends me off in random directions as a result. So often I'll, we'll start a book with an idea. I might say, let's, let's do a book about, you know, I've got a sore tooth. And then Terry will draw something and I'll go, oh, yes, we could use that. And then I'll start generating a plot and then Terry will draw more drawings based on that plot which gives me more ideas. Terry and I can create a very big mess together and Jill is very good then at coming and um, sorting it all out and going drop that, lose that, um, this is where the interesting bit is. So we generate a lot of ideas and um, that's the answer to where, where do all the ideas for the levels come from it's you make lists just endless lists and the more ideas you have the more choice you have and the more chance there is that one or two of those levels is going to be really funny or useful in some way or memorable so for each book to get 13 new levels i would generate i don't know 50 60 70 different level ideas some come from readers uh, sometimes people send us a little picture. Um, the Trunkinator came that way. 
someone had drawn a boxing elephant and I just loved loved the idea. Um, the, the Ninja Snail Training Academy was suggested to me by a class of excited students many years ago and I they, they yelled millions of things at me but I just remembered that Ninja Snail Training Academy and so I started thinking logically about that well, how would you train snails what could they do um, what would be the drawbacks to being a ninja snail um, obviously they'd move so slow that anyone if they were attacking someone all you'd have to do is step on them but there is a very good use for them and I think that's at the end of 65 story no I've forgotten which book they stories. They, they deliver the manuscript for them it's in um, one of those speaking of the story stories reader. um what is the best level to live in during lockdown ah well um that's actually going to come in the 130 story tree house i've put a special level in uh it's called the toilet paper factory because <laughs> i don't know if you had that problem there but in australia yes, everyone we did. was rather panicked about toilet paper and they were fighting for it in the aisles and um yeah very unfortunate so i thought we really need a toilet paper factory we so do. if this ever happens again that'll be one less thing to worry about and toilet rolls are fun too because you know there's so and many uses fun. for them mm -hmm. luckily Apart i live in a rainforest and i have loads of leaves around me so i was actually okay but it was a very big <laughs> problem here um dylan has asked is it true that you are a master of chainsaw juggling? Um, is it true that I'm a master of chainsaw juggling? Uh, um, Be very careful. Next question. <laughs> I, I want to demonstrate. I can juggle yeah. three oranges. Uh, that's pretty close to chainsaw that's juggling. That's a step I towards, I think. That's not bad. Yeah. Um, are you going to keep... I'd like to be able I mean, you can you could learn. This is the best time to start learning. Yeah, um, I have. I do, I do know how to juggle, but I've never juggled chainsaws. Um, that would be level. fascinating. Um, I do love circuses, and I love people with circus skills. And and you'll find in the books, there's a lot of circus type stuff going uh -huh. on. What? You said obviously how Terry came up with the 13 stories in the original and you've gone through the 13s. Why is 13 such a kind of continuously relevant number to you guys? Uh, it's just because when we were first doing this, there's a book in Australia called The Bad Book. And I've got a copy here. Uh, Terry and I, when, when he was, this was just tricking, when he was in the margins, I said, I think we should do a book together. And we did a book called The Bad Book. And this one, you'll see there's many less words and a lot more pictures. And so we started doing everything bad. There was bad poems, bad rhymes, bad jokes, bad children, bad parents, bad bad everything there's uh, i think you can see the bad baby there about to blow up a christmas tree very very bad book uh which the australian kids loved a lot then we did the very the very bad book which was even badder and um i think in that one we had some killer koalas from outer space um and i just happened there we had this story about killer koalas and i happen to have a killer koala right on hand hang on this is everyone thinks koalas are cuddly uh, but horrifying but these these are the killer ones whoa and that's what they look like that's the last thing you'll see if you try to cu cu cuddle a killer koala they uh, they get their claws out and they rip your face off right right there so oh <laughs> terry did that that was that was that was that terry, was terry. Um, <laughs> uh so we we did these two books and then we said let's do 
the very, very bad book. And we came along to the meeting and uh, we hadn't seen each other for quite a long time. And I said, what have you got, Terry? And he said, I've got a picture of my finger. And I was like, great. Uh, what else have you got? And he said, I've got a close-up of my finger. <laughs> and that's literally uh, in the book when Andy and Terry are trying to figure out what to say, uh, what to do. Uh, you see Terry's picture of his finger and then you see the close-up of his finger Very and then you see finger. the rest of his sketchbook, which is completely empty. And I said, great, you know, that's, that's going to make a really bad book. Um, I said, what about we do a bad book where we never actually get the book written? We'll just say um, the book is so bad that we were going to do this, but Terry didn't do his work. And I said, let's live in a really bad treehouse. We'll, um, it'll be cool, but, but dangerous. And it will have, you know, the tank full of man-eating sharks down the bottom, no, no fence around it. Uh, we'll have a bowling alley and so that the bowling balls are falling off and hitting people on the head. So it was all based around this idea of, you know, the opposite, the bad place. And I said, Terry, can you draw that treehouse and put a marshmallow machine in that, that floats around and fires marshmallows into our mouths whenever we're hungry? And uh, so that we're just living on sugar, you know, another not very good thing. And so Terry drew this. And this, as I said, was way beyond what I thought uh, was, was possible. I didn't even know he could draw this well. And I counted them and I went, one, two, you've drawn 13 levels. This is amazing. Oh, yeah, that's the kind of treehouse I would love to have had when I was growing up. I'd love to have it now. I said, uh -huh. let's write the book about the treehouse. Um, we'll still keep that idea that we can't think of what to write about, but we'll explore the treehouse and that'll be a way for us to live. So the pure accident that he happened to draw 13 levels becomes an iron law in our, in our books. So our books right. are kind of chaos and logic. Um, there's a weird balance of the two. Terry brings the chaos and me and Jill uh -huh. bring as much logic as we can. Is there really any logic? There's a lot of chaos for sure. I'm not sure about logic though. Speaking there's always... of your, I mean, I mean, yeah, there's always a little bit, of it, I guess, but nah, not really. <laughs> Speaking of your um, killer koala, um, you're in a very interesting room with a lot of interesting figures behind you. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about where you are? Because I'm really scared there's a, a big Furby behind you and it's creeping me out a little bit. There's a big what behind me? I, a Furby. Did you have Furbies when you were younger? Like... It was a big thing Furbies. in the UK and they're very creepy. They're like gremlins, but it was yeah, horrifying. Yeah. And I keep looking at that thing behind you that I think is a, not a Furby, but a Furby, and it's freaking me out. Hmm. Um, no, it's not a Furby. I mean, that thing, is that what you mean? No, the owl or the cat that's above Terry's head on the shelf. Ah. Uh, that's a monkey. That's oh. Humpty Dumpty. Um, that's some spare heads. Uh, <laughs> that's a cat's head. Um, it's full of toys here, um, things that interest me. Um, I'm a real collector. And I, the thing that I notice when I'm uh, anywhere is I'll collect odd things, things that are unusual, that are disturbing, um, that are funny. Um, and after a while, you get a reputation for this and people start giving them giving, to you. Yeah. Anything, this is my writing studio, which is above a garage in the backyard. And so I can come out here. I've got a lot of music. Music's very important to me to get me in the mood to write. Uh, there's a lot of books. Um, a lot of there's books. There's lots of comics. Um, I grew up loving comics as well as um, uh, books like Enid Blyton, um, great UK author. Uh, she had books like The Magic Wishing Chair uh -huh. and, uh, of course, The Faraway Tree. And yeah. uh, I think there's a little bit of Faraway Tree in the treehouse. You've got a disco cake. ball as well for when you ever have a party. That's great. Yep. Uh, yeah, what yeah, sort of, 
music have you been listening? Like, what sort of music do you listen to when you write? Um, it's usually kind of noisy, kind of fun music. Um, there's a couple of favourites on the desk at the moment. There's uh, Beastie Boys. Um, always the, the music I tend to love makes you feel happy. Um, yeah. An old band called Devo. They were, you know, musical clowns. Um, so it just gets me in a good mood and then, then ideas start flowing. So music is extremely important, uh, as is reading, just reading uh -huh. anything. I read fiction, non-fiction, comics, um, newspapers, whatever. Uh, the ideas are just flowing all the time. Have you been reading much during lockdown? Is there things that you would recommend to anyone out there that wants to like? Um, I've been reading an enormous amount. Um, I have gone back to some of my old comics, actually. That I used to read these science fiction uh, Twilight Zone style comics about wow. scientists in laboratories making monsters that they then can't control. Um, things like that, or time travel. Uh, really, they excited me when I was 10 years old. They still excite me today. And that will feed into, into whatever book I'm writing. If you were to have a mascot, what would it be? Ooh, a mascot. Um, it wouldn't be a killer koala. They're too dangerous. Um, it's probably, you know, I've had, a, I've had a Godzilla for a long time. And um, that's that's one of my my favourite toys, and I can use it to um, to give you an example of how stories are created. Yeah, um, I, I get this guy, and I used to make photographs of stories. I used to take photos of the toys, and so this was uh, an old one. This was a a little baby. And I take two opposite toys. So one is a is a tiny little helpless baby, and one is a great big Godzilla. And so I imagine that they meet. And when you you do that, you're expecting as a reader uh, a certain thing to happen. So when you see a little baby and a Godzilla, you're probably expecting a certain outcome. Which is what? What do you reckon, Stephen? I, 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 I'm scared to say anything at this point. <laughs> you would, most of us would expect this little baby is in big trouble. And I don't know, it's either going to get, I'm the either going to get stomped on or it's going to get uh, picked up, put in the dinosaur's yeah. mouth, and uh, wow. it's going to be a very sad ending. Poor baby. Poor baby. But. There's another, there's another more interesting story. And what I always ask, and I've asked it ever since I was a kid, what if, what if it wasn't the dinosaur eating the baby, but the baby eats the dinosaur? And so then I start thinking logically, how would the baby kill the dinosaur? It can't just, you know, walk up to it and headbutt it. No one would believe that. Um, Perhaps it uses its its nappy, uh, its diaper, to to take it off. The smell overwhelms the Godzilla, and then the baby is able to climb up the back and stab it in the head with or in the eyes with its nappy pins, and um, and then it can start eating Godzilla. So that we we reverse the expectations of the story. That's what we're doing in the Treehouse books all uh -huh. the time. Um, there's another possibility, and it's not just that the dinosaur eats the baby or the baby eats the dinosaur. It could be that the dinosaur and the baby... Well, I, I would ask, if you saw a little baby on the street and there was no parents, what would you do? And don't say eat it because I'm not going to believe you. Most of us would pick it up and, yeah. like, look after it. So why not the dinosaur? The dinosaur could pick up the baby and um, take it home. <laughs> its head's just come off. Does uh, that baby have a skull head as, as it pops off? Uh, yes, there is a reason for that. 
Um, the dinosaur takes the baby home and raises it as a baby, a dinosaur baby. Or the other option is that the, di the baby adopts the dinosaur. See how your thinking tends to go in one way. And what I would do is the opposite here. Um, someone saying, carry it to a candy shop. A lot of people think, eat um, the baby. This is terrible. Eat the baby. No, where the baby takes, carries Godzilla home. Invincible and baby, yeah, that will eat it, eat takes, it. Oh my god, takes it to uh to its parents. Look, so basically, found anything, the park, is anything is possible, anything uh, is possible at this point, basically. Now, there's a, another possibility, and we're getting very close to the end of the session, but we can finish on a nice story here. And this is a story that no one would expect, and that is that. The dinosaur and the baby see each other. They don't eat each other. They don't adopt each other, but they look deep into each other's eyes and fall instantly in love. And they fly through the air and they <laughs> kiss. And it gets worse because then they get married. And even worse because then they have children. And the interesting question is what sort of children would a dinosaur and a baby have? And the great thing about toys, the reason I have a room full of them is because I can find out. I can remove the head from that and switch the heads over and then we see their child. Isn't that a fine baby? Wow. Boy, girl, whatever. Was that like a strange it's analogy also... for you and Jill? Because <laughs> that was a very relevant story, I feel like. There's also another one. This is the unfortunate uh, little brother, Just I think, uh, who comes in and annoys everyone. We can't uh, so there's, see it. There's two like... children. And we can now use these as a basis for many more stories. So after all that, we might be just at the beginning of of a really a interesting story amazing that's why we take a year to write each book because we're messing around and trying to find the really interesting story every yeah. time and uh, as as i said 130 story will be out in uh, october the 20th so you can um we are very excited for it sadly that is where we're gonna have to end things i'm afraid but that was a great place oh. to wrap up it has been one of the strangest but best mornings I think I've ever had. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to everyone Thank who you. joined in. Thank you for everyone's questions. They were amazing. We learned more than I ever needed to know about things and I'm very happy that I have. Um, we do have a great day coming up today and tomorrow with some amazing events. So please do check out our socials and the website um, and sign up. But once again, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Andy. Um, thank you everyone who can make this whole festival possible. So a round of applause for everyone, for Andy, for you and for everyone. Thank you very and, much. And thank you once again for joining in. Bye.